Yeah, thank you very much. And I don't know how many of you know ThoughtWorks. Just as a background, we are a consulting company. We are over 10,000 people and work with clients and help them write software, which means we get exposed to questions around software architecture and modern trends in software architecture quite a bit. I'm a, ah, sorry. I'm a consultant at ThoughtWorks, and, um, but we are also a founding member of the Green Software Foundation, which really helps because that is an organization where like-minded people get together, the big cloud providers, consulting companies, and all sorts of other companies that are interested in the topic. I guess for this audience, I don't have to explain why we are even talking about this topic, about carbon emissions. It is, of course, about global warming. This is a really nice visualization. I like visualizations, but it is really a sad, and at the same time, very urgent topic. So, we do talk about sustainability quite a bit these days, and when it comes to IT, what we're really talking about a lot is we like our boxes in IT, right? So we talk about two different things. We categorize and classify them, and usually it is done by people saying we talk about sustainability by IT, which means I want to make an organization, anything, any process, something like that, more sustainable by the use of IT, by using an IT solution. I'm not going to talk about that at all today. What I want to talk about is sustainability of IT. So that is what you can do to make an IT solution that runs anywhere on premise, on your laptop, in the cloud, to make that more sustainable. And I will explain, of course, in a little more detail what I do mean by sustainability. <clears throat> I think it is interesting or important to talk about this topic because in the end, we often hear from clients, I don't want to talk about sustainability of IT, it's just small fry. We can find much bigger fish, we can have more emission savings if we look at our core business, at the real thing. But the question then is, with this line of argument, you can always point the finger somewhere else and say, oh, you know what, our business doesn't create that many emissions, why don't we wait until the companies, the organizations that cause even more emissions until they clean it up because they're in a better position. I do think, and especially when it's easy, and I will explain towards the end of the talk that it's not that hard, when it is easy to actually reduce the emissions of the IT, solu IT solutions themselves. Before we start, let's go into a couple of key concepts, and one of them is carbon efficiency. You often see these letters, CO2e, Important to point out, the E doesn't stand for emissions. The E stands for equivalent because, of course, there are more greenhouse gases. And in the end, what is often done is there are conversion factors, and then they're saying, okay, we're looking at a different gas, and we combine it, and we do the equivalent of CO2. And then, especially in English, CO2 is long, and it gets abbreviated into carbon. One fundamental assumption, of course, is when we talk about IT, is that we talk about computers. Computers run on electricity, and electricity causes CO2 emissions. And some of you might be thinking, oh, solar power, and that's exactly what I'm going to come back to. It is about the mix of electricity generation as well. First things first, though, this is a diagram from a report, and I assume you will have access to the slides afterwards. All of the data is sourced, so at least, I mean, Sometimes, of course, there's multiple sources, or the sources are a bit unclear, but at least I do provide sources for all the data, and it's not just I read on the internet somewhere. So this is a report that was done by Microsoft, and it's data from real servers, from, a, from the so-called spec power database. I'll show you an example later on. The key concept here is this thing called energy proportionality, and that shows the relationship between the load on the server and the energy consumption. And I guess most of you know this, obviously, a server that doesn't run a program still consumes electricity. That was pretty bad in the past. Today, with the advances, especially from laptops and mobile phones, a lot of progress has been made. But this is relatively real data averaged over three popular kinds of servers. And you can see at zero load, I'm still using 25% of the electricity of the max load. And especially talking about lowly utilized servers, you can see the numbers work out really nicely. I can go from 10% to 40%. That's a fourfold increase on compute power, but I'm only doubling the um, electricity I need. Of course, this is a little math trick. If you go another 40 percentage points, it doesn't work out so nicely anymore. But let's think about it, especially when you're not in a public cloud. There are often a lot of servers that are hardly ever used. So then thinking about how can we use the server a bit more is really a good idea to do. 
It is not only the servers, though, that need electricity, whether it's your own on-premise or somewhere where you host a direct or a public cloud, you have at least light air conditioning and usually UPS, uninterruptible power supplies, they use electricity. And the point here is there's a factor called the power usage effectiveness. And what it basically expresses is the percentage of extra electricity you need. So in this example, 10 kilowatts for the servers, 2 kilowatts, that's 20%, which is, of course, a factor of 1.2 of real power that you need to draw from the grid. Speaking of the servers, there is something else. The servers do also, I mean, there's the electricity and the carbon emissions combined with the usage, but it is also the um, carbon that is embedded, it's, it's um, called embodied carbon, from the production of the server. And this here, this data is really hard to come by. This is a report about one specific Dell server, the one at the top right here. And you can, the chart is a bit awkward. The left column is the, the total. So look at only the other columns. And you can see that the manufacturing of the server cost about four tons of CO2 emissions, and the use also four tons. So half the carbon emissions are related to the production of the server. Of course, there's a lot of assumptions being made here about the um, usage of the server, how long it is being used. But one thing that is probably also clear then immediately is if you keep using the server for longer, this relationship would change because the embodied emission, the, the manufacturing, doesn't increase, but over the lifetime, you would use more electricity from the use. And then, of course, if you do this on a yearly basis, you could write it off. You can subtract the four tons from manufacturing, not over three years, but maybe over five or six years, and therefore have a, in your server farm a better CO2 value, if you will. If you wonder why there's a negative um, number at the end, that's end of life, and the assumption here is made there's some recycling, which gives you back resources that otherwise would be carbon intensive to create. As I said, the data is not hard to get by. Sorry, it's, it's hard to get by. It's not easy to get by. And this report really is an exception. And it is 70 pages long. So if you want to delve into the details, that's what you need to look up to. A very different topic is, of course, the efficiency of programming languages. And again, not that much research happening in the field. The paper that almost everybody cites, and the one I'm citing today as well, is um, a 2017 paper by a university. There are six researchers. They ran a lot of benchmarks, and they measured both the, um, how long it took to do something and how much electricity was being used. And what you can see here, you can see that the blue and the orange bar columns are usually the same, which means they are confirming by experiment that the runtime, like how long it takes to run, is more or less the same. It's not always the case. Interestingly, for example, in Swift, the energy uses is less. Apple ob obviously wants to optimize for battery consumption here. But what we can also see is how big the differences can be. I mean, this is a, I thought with this audience, I can show a chart with a logarithmic axis. So C is, of course, the benchmark here. So it's why it's a one. And you can see a language like Rust is very, very efficient. C++ almost. I was personally surprised when I saw to see how good Java is, because Java does run on a, on a runtime. It is somewhat interpreted, if you will. But I mean, huge respect for the Java runtime anyway. But we can also then see how big the impact is for other programming languages. And for example, JavaScript is very popular. And I'm not saying to rewrite everything in JavaScript, but take it as a consideration when you're designing an architecture to think the same algorithm that runs in JavaScript probably needs twice as long as in Java. Therefore, I need twice as many computers. Because in the end, on the server side, it is not so much about how long something runs. It is more really how many requests can I handle per server, or then, by extension, how many servers do I need for my website? And if I can half the number of servers, that's good. At the same time, I'm a huge fan of Rust, but I wouldn't generally suggest to write, say, an e-commerce website or microservices for an e-commerce website in Rust. It's expensive to do from a programming perspective. If you're writing video games, you're used to optimizing. If you're writing business custom applications, probably not so much. And um, one last thing to mention here, the, the Python values are, of course, very bad. And maybe you are thinking, oh, all the machine learning is happening in Python. How can that be? In the end, most of what's happening in Python is that Python is the wrapper, and the actual implementation is either done in C or is actually running on specialized compute hardware. So don't overestimate. Or don't, yeah, don't think that Python is terrible for machine learning in that case. Good. 
Next topic, carbon awareness. And here, the letters are grams of CO2 emissions divided by kilowatt hours. So how many grams of CO2 emissions am I causing per kilowatt hour of electricity that I'm using? The data is all available. And this is a chart from two weeks ago from Germany. You can see the spikes. The yellow one is the sun, so that's the solar generation. So you can see that every day the sun sh shone in that week. And um, you probably noticed the chart is flat at the top. This is a percentage chart. It gives you the energy mix at any point in time. And for example, if you look at this, I guess you can see it from um, on the screen as well. If I run a workload at point A in time, <coughs> at point A, I get a lot of solar and a lot of wind, the yellow and the green one. If I only run it a few hours later in the evening, the, the electricity mix looks very, very different. You do see the little spike, I think you can see it, the little spike in light blue. This is the fabled hydropower, you know, when you have excess energy, you're pumping up water and you let it run down. It does boost a little bit, but the big things that swing up when the wind and the sun go away is, in this case, brown coal and gas, which is exactly what we don't want. So the idea is simple, right? What if I know this and run my compute load at the time when the electricity mix is better? then I'm producing fewer carbon emissions running the same workload. No optimization needed. There's software for this. You can even get forecasts where you can say, should I run it now? Should I run it in a few hours? And I'll give you an example later in the talk. The reality looks more like this. So now we're not seeing a stacked chart. We see the absolute energy. And you can see the black line shows the actual consumption. And you can see how the consumption is made up. And you can also see how during the night we're using less electricity which is nice because there's less solar power being generated. And again, we can see those two points here. And I don't know whether you can see it. At point A, the yellow bit goes above the black line. That means we were creating more electricity was actually needed, which is why at the bottom it goes below the zero, which is an export to our neighboring countries. But if you think about it now, if you were running a load at point B, and you would shift it to point A, you would almost have free electricity. I mean, you don't get it for free, but I mean, the electricity is in excess anyway. But then again, this is only Germany. Who knows what the electricity would do in another country? So it's really quite complex. But the idea should be clear. Try to shift the workloads when you can to a time where the electricity mix is better, within limits. If everybody did it all the time, it wouldn't work either. And, of course, you your use case needs to allow for it, right? I mean, you can't be on an e-commerce website and say, uh, wait, the wind is not that great at the moment, wait for a while and come back and with your shopping when there's more wind outside. There's, of course, time and space. You can also think about the electricity mix across different geographies. And again, the data is available on electricity maps, for example. And you can see that on a country level, very important, by the way, this chart shows the consumption, not the production of electricity. You care about what you're consuming. And for example, electricity maps considers nuclear power as green because it doesn't, when it's running, emit any CO2. You might have personally different opinions about this, or you might want to have the construction phase in mind as well. This is how it works. That's why also I picked Finland as an example. And you can see almost everything is carbon free. On the left, one of those circle charts, 96%, but only 54% is renewable. The rest is the new nuclear power station that they built. Although somebody said there's trouble already after a 20-year construction phase. You get the idea. You can see 40 grams of CO2 at the moment per kilowatt hour. And sometimes you can shift your workload also in different, into different data centers. Of course, you can't shift everything. On the one hand, the latency might cause a problem. But on the other hand, you might not have the hardware available. To give you a real example, this is, um, I guess many of you are familiar with Stable Diffusion, one of the image generators. This is from their website, or actually on Hugging Faces, the page about the model. And you can see that they are saying they use these A100, yeah, they are A100s, NVIDIA graphics cards with 40 gigabytes of RAM, and they use 150,000 hours of it to train the model, which they reckon was responsible for about 11 tons, 11,000 kilograms of CO2 equivalents here. And they did this in US East. So you could now think what would happen 
if they didn't run it in US East, but say in Sweden, whatever that, or Finland, I think is EU North one. If they shifted it over there, could they reduce this? The question is, that data center, would it even have a lot of these graphics cards? And could they get access to it? And would it be more expensive in that data center? But the idea, I think, is clear. You can shift it both in space as well as in time. And this is the overview chart. This is something that the Green Software Foundation has on their website as well. So the idea of green computing is, on the one hand, you get carbon efficiency, either through hardware or through software. And you get carbon awareness. And you can do shifting either by time or by space. With those foundations, let's move into the next topic. Oftentimes, people talk about measuring emissions. I have added estimating here, because that's a key part of what I'll be talking about. And I think we cannot really measure everything anyway. We need to estimate. And you'll see in a moment why that is the case, I hope. Many of you, I guess, are familiar with this company called Etsy. They're this marketplace for handmade goods. They are a client of ThoughtWorks. We worked with them on a number of different initiatives. And if you know them a little bit only, you realize that they probably have an agenda in that space as well. And they have very early onset. They want to reduce the electricity, the energy use. Because the assumption, of course, is if we use less energy, we um, reduce our CO2 footprint. But at the same time, they said we need to be realistic. It needs to be in correlation with the business development. And then you get charts. These are all from an article on Etsy's website, on their blog, on the engineering blog. And what you can see here, you see the green line, which shows, I mean, it's, it's just depicting an example, right? Over time, the development of their business. And in orange, the development of their electricity use. In the middle, they roughly grow at the same rate. So they're not getting any worse. Twice, am twice the amount of customers, twice the amount of business, double the electricity use. That's OK. What's not OK is the left-hand side. If you're doubling your business, you don't want more than double the energy use. Where you really want to be is, of course, on the right-hand side. You can grow your business way more, and you only increase the electricity a little bit more. So this is what they meant. They wanted to reduce the energy use, not necessarily. They would consider the growth on the rightmost diagram as a reduction, because they now need less energy per amount of business that they do. So, they were chasing this for a long time. This diagram shows a point in time. You can see this from the beginning of 2018 to, 20, to the end of 2019. And in their own data center, they could measure the electricity, the energy use. Then they started the migration to GCP. But in GCP, as you can probably imagine, you can't measure the electricity you're using because you're using the servers in the cloud, and GCP doesn't provide the data. And even if they wanted to, they probably couldn't tell you your servers, we can measure what your servers are using, because how would you do it if they shift the workload from one server to another? So they needed to come up with an estimate. Before we go into details of how they are doing it and how the industry is doing it today, one key thing, though, to look at is the data at the bottom. The PUE in their own data center was 1.39, and GCP specifies that the PUE in their data centers is 1.1. That's a massive reduction. I mean, just on those numbers, that's a 20% reduction in overall um, electricity use. But if you think about the efficiency of the cloud data center, it, it only uses 25%, right? Because the other one added almost 40%. The Google data center only adds 10%. So that's really a reduction by 75% of what the data center needs. But be that as it may, there's a 20% reduction simply by running the same software in a more efficient data center, which is nice. So what happened then in history is Etsy came up with this idea called the cloud jewels to estimate their energy use, because they needed to do it to stay true to their goal of reducing energy consumption. We worked with Etsy, ThoughtWorks loves open source. We took some of the ideas, we worked with them, and we created this tool called Cloud Carbon Footprint. And now we are seeing that the ideas in Cloud Carbon Footprint are being taken up by further open source projects or by some of the cloud providers. Etsy themselves actually use Cloud Carbon Footprint these days. But it was really instrumental that they also made available their implementation, their methodology available as open source software, so we could freely build on that. I'm going to show you how this roughly works. And in the end, the methodology is almost always the same. The first step is, you try to find out how many resources you used. 
and that's generally compute, storage, networking, and memory. It should be said that in the original Etsy one, for example, they said networking is such a mess, we're not even going to put it in there. It doesn't use much in comparison to everything else. In Cloud Carbon Footprint, and you can look at the source code, you can see how it is actually done. There is also estimations for that and even for memory. The usage data comes from the API of the cloud provider. So for AWS, it's the cost. In Google, it's the billing API. And Azure has something called the consumption API. And then you actually want to take the usage and convert somehow the usage into how much electricity did that, need, did that use. So one vCPU hour is how many watts? We don't know. So the great approach is this thing, the spec database. So this is a database with almost 1,000 server systems. And this is the server that I showed you early on. This is the entry for that server. And you can see a couple of things back from before. You can see, and I marked it in orange here, that the server uses at 100% load 432 watts of power. And at the bottom, you can see at 10% load, it uses 114. And this is, of course, shown in the diagram on the right-hand side. And now you have to flip it like this, and you would get the energy proportionality um, chart. You would also see this diagram on the right-hand side shows you again the relationship between the compute load and the power needed. So for many systems, you actually have this information. The question becomes, how do you know which servers the cloud provider uses? And that then becomes basically a massive bookkeeping task. And indeed, a lot of the source code of Cloud Carbon Footprint are massive lookup tables. Just to say, if this is such an instance type, it is probably going to be that server. Or it is one of those servers, let's take the average, and so on. There's one super cool open source project. This is not, not used by Cloud Carbon Footprint yet. Kepler is a cool open source project that uses the hardware built into modern PC mainboards to get the actual power use. I don't know if you have a gaming PC, you know the software that shows you how much wattage your graphics card is using and your computer. Kepler can access this, and it also inserts, using eBPF, the packet filter, some code to figure out which Kubernetes container is running. And then it can attribute the actual power usage as measured, as properly measured on the server against the right Kubernetes pod. And you wouldn't have to have this estimation guesswork. If you care about this, look for, there's a meetup next to Tuesday, I think. There's a green computing user group in Karlsruhe in Germany, but they are available as hybrid um, events online. And at that point, one of the developers of Kepler will talk in more detail. I'm super curious myself. I've told you everything now I know about Kepler, but I think it's a great approach to think, how, you do, how do we get to actually measuring away from the estimation? Forget everything I've said, back to estimation. Many other cases, just so you get a feel, standard factors. We're saying 2 point watt hours per one hour of virtual CPU, but only 0 0.8 watt hours per terabyte of HDD, of hard drive storage. But even there, you need to be careful. If you're storing it redundantly, you need to multiply by two, right? And usually, you're on a rate, so you need to multiply by two. So there's a lot of this done. And in the end, there's a lot of estimates. And these estimates, I mean, symbolically, I'm showing it here, they get multiplied, which means the errors also get multiplied. The PUE is basically what the cloud providers give us. So they're all roughly at 1.1. I think Google is 1.1, and Amazon is 1.12, or something like this, all in the same ballpark. And then in the end, that gives you the amount, of, uh, the amount of energy, the kilowatt hours you need. Now you need to convert that into the actual CO2 emissions. And sometimes you get good data. This is from GCP, but it's not a dashboard. This is actually, unfortunately, just a report that GCP provided at some point in time. But again, you can see the differences here. If you just look at, for example, Europe North 1, Finland, at um, 127 grams of CO2 emissions versus Europe Central 2 in Warsaw, 572. So if you can, don't run your machine learning models in Warsaw, run them in Finland, for example. The numbers may be different today, and what you can also do is, of course, you can not use the data by the cloud providers if they exist. You can use published data in general about data centers, or you can use something like electricity maps and use their API to get data if you want to have a better conversion. 
Um, one thing to note is that, of course, the last column is um, all zeros because Google says they're carbon free. This is, of course, impossible because if you have electricity that comes with a carbon footprint, how do you take it out? You're basically buying certificates. And what you can see is that Google, of course, at least is doing that. They're buying all these certificates. But in the end, it is the second last column that is important to see how much is actually created, how much CO2 is created because of that. Right, and that means you have the carbon-2 emissions, and then you only have to add the embodied carbon. You only, the, 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 the other one, the electricity, is called scope-2 emissions in this context, and scope-3 is the hardware production, and you add this, you already have roughly an idea of what compute hardware you're talking about. As much as you can, you get the precise data, otherwise you get estimated data for the scope-3 and add it at the last step. And then a tool like Cloud Carbon Footprint can show you a diagram like this and can show you this is the last month and this is your CO2 footprint every month and this is the electricity use every month. And they are somewhat correlated, obviously, but not always precisely correlated. And in the end, it's really important to understand that you want a baseline and from that baseline, you do want to improve. The cloud providers have their own tooling these days. All three of them do. The methodology in general isn't open, so they don't publish in detail the methodology, but it is more or less what I've... You can't really do it differently than what I explained so far. We should be careful, though. For example, at AWS, as far as I know, it might have changed in the last month, but I'm sure that at least before last month, they didn't include scope 3 emissions. On Azure, it's also nice, but there you have to pay for the underlying software in their cloud to actually get the data in the first place. The good news about using something like Cloud Carbon Footprint, of course, is you can see the methodology, you can extend it, and you can run it across multiple clouds. But as I said, if you then compare the data, and we've done this, it doesn't always come out the same. It's roughly the same, but not exactly the same. I mean, one of our clients is Otto, the big e-commerce company, and I heard the, um, their CIO talk about sustainability, and he said exactly the same thing. He said, we just wanted to fix one tool, one methodology, get the baseline, and if that's systematically 10% wrong, it doesn't really matter because we want to see how we're improving or how it's developing. Remember the, the Etsy chart? If we double our business, does it double or does it triple or does it go up by 1.5? And then the systemic error that we're seeing here by using maybe an average per server is maybe not so important. It may come to bite us later, to be honest with you. I mean, there's, of course, advances in computer architectures. Not all systems are Intel systems anymore. In some of the clouds, you get ARM-based systems these days. There's the RISC-V processes on the horizon. We don't quite know, but that's, yeah, for what we have, this is what we can realistically do and what everybody is doing. And, and in, as in so many cases, you probably get 80% there with 20% of the effort. This is another tool unrelated. They have um, written a paper about their methodology, and this is a tool you can use just on their web page to estimate how much CO2 emissions your machine learning task will need. And what you can see here is I took the example from Stable Diffusion and I put this in. I said use these A100 GPUs, 150,000 hours on AWS in US East, and the estimator says 13 tons, 13.8 tons. Do you remember what um, Hagen Faces themselves said? They said 11 tons. So again, not the same, it's actually off by quite a bit, but it's not a completely different ballpark. It is still reasonable, so... And again, this is of course no proof that this tool is always accurate or as accurate as I'm saying now, but I'm saying there are these tools out there and many of them go through the length of describing the methodology. There's many others that you can also find. So now, in the last 10 minutes, I want to talk a little bit about how to reduce the emissions. And reduction here is really the eliminations. It is not about offsetting or the carbon capture. That's still what some people talk about. You can somehow capture the CO2 out of the atmosphere. We're not talking about that. We're talking about using less electricity in the end. There's a relatively established field, I would say, that's called FinOps, financial ops. It takes, of course, a cue from DevOps, which is this... And there's a whole set of companies in that space that provide organizations help with optimizing the cloud cost. And that's what FinOps is mostly about, to say how many resources are you using, and there's lots and lots of guides. 
on the internet, freely available, or paid services to say, what can I do to reduce my cloud bill at the end of the month? But because there's this correlation between the resources you're using and the electricity that is needed, and therefore the carbon emissions, almost, and almost anything you do in a FinOps context is also helpful. And that's why people started calling something else green ops. And if you think of it as a Venn diagram, and I thought about putting it on a slide, if you think about it as a Venn diagram between FinOps and green ops, they're very much overlapping. They're not the same, but there's a lot of overlap. I don't know about you, I don't know where you work, what your background is. We've tried to approach companies and with a green ops message and saying, hey, you can be more sustainable. Very, very difficult. If you approach the companies with saying, we can reduce your cloud foot bill and you're doing something good for the environment, much, much easier to arrive. So there is this, this FinOps, green ops is really interlinked. I don't know what happened to it. Adrian Cockcroft started calling it Dev Sus Ops for Dev Sustainability Ops. I guess, I don't know, the millennials use SUS in a different way, maybe. I don't know. It just kind of didn't take foot. So it's FinOps and Green Ops these days. And sometimes, of course, if you are reducing, I mentioned it before, if you're trying to reduce the carbon emissions by shifting a workload from one data center to another, that might actually be more expensive, to be honest with you. In the end, though, what I'm showing here at the bottom, you do need metrics and reporting. You can't really do anything sensible without measuring it. You need to know what you're doing. And I don't know about your cloud cost. We've seen it at many, many clients. You have the calculators. You're trying all these estimates before. How much is it going to cost? And in the end, you always have to have a dashboard to see what you're really being charged at the end of the day. It is, there are so many non-linearities in there that you probably have to, or likely in our experience, always have to measure anyway. So. One thing that I guess I've implied a number of times now is using a public cloud particularly does help already. I mean, you have the elastic resources, and they're not only elastic in the sense that they, the cloud providers, can put more load on the servers, which means in total, all the users of the cloud need fewer servers in total, other than you are an e-commerce website and you have a lot of servers sitting around just for peak season. You can share this. This is the ultimate. This is how EC2, the Amazon Web Services, started, right? But you also get these things that is often called scale to zero. So zero emissions for zero workload, especially true for Lambda functions. But then you could argue maybe they need a bit more when they run. I don't know. But something like spot instances, you also get a financial incentive to say, I don't care when my workload is run. I'm doing it at a time when it's convenient for the cloud provider, which means they can, again, stack the workload a little bit better. Anyone in the audience, by the way, who knows of organizations that turn off their servers properly? I asked the internet also. Maybe I'm not asking the right parts of the internet. It's really hard. It doesn't seem like anybody's really doing it, although you could, right? I mean, you could actually say, <clears throat> currently there's 100 servers I don't need. Put them in this, whatever they're called, S3 power state, and then we send a magic packet to wake them up. I don't know whether anybody's doing it, but that, of course, would also go towards this idea of scale to zero. Next one, workload shifting. I think I covered in great length already. And on the data center efficiency, I talked about the fact that the clouds actually work really well already, that the efficiencies they provide are really hard to get in your own data centers or in other data centers because they have the scaling effects. They've done a lot of research. So this is really hard to compete with. Now, last set of slides, last diagram. A couple of things you could do to reduce emissions. One thing, very, very simple, resource scheduling, not even cleverly. Just turn off hardware when you know you don't need it. I mean, I did the math and I need to read it up. If you keep servers running, say for your build pipeline or something like that, 24-7, that's 168 hours per week. If you run it only 10 hours on the working days when the development team is actually working, hopefully, um, then you only have 50 hours, obviously, right? That's a 70% reduction. So sometimes really simple things can make a difference. And again, if you are running this in a public cloud, you don't need these servers. Somebody else can use them, and more, fewer servers are needed overall. If they sit in your own data center, maybe you can turn them off. I don't know. Another one, to give you a bit more of an involved example, you can sometimes have to split storage and compute. And that's often the case with Hadoop, where you have the processing and the file system on the same machines. And then a machine maybe has the file system filled up, but it's only using 20% of the CPU load, and you have to scale the servers for compute as well. 
if you separate them out, you can scale the compute server separately from the storage server. So think about, can I scale and what am I scaling with what dimension? Here's a nice example. I just basically want you to read something. Um, reorganization of batch jobs. There's a fantastic case study you can find on the Green Software Foundation. This is UBS, one of the banks. And they thought about, we run, I don't know how many of you work in banks or have been working for banks. They run a lot of batch jobs. Can we improve this? And yes, absolutely. So they did one thing. They looked at this. They looked at the red bar. This is for four days, obviously. The red bar is the originally allotted time slot for running the batch job. How much CO2 would have been produced? What they then do is they say, we can get a forecast. And as I said, there are APIs available already. They're not perfect either. They're like cloud carbon footprint. They're good approximations. If on the 19th of September, they ran it at the optimally forecast time, they would have had the gray emissions. So they would have reduced the emissions. But then it's a forecast. And as we all know, with weather forecasts, they're not always precise. The actual um, measured emissions would have been even lower on that day. On the next day, on the 20th, you can see red would be when they ran it whenever they ran it. Gray is had they run it or when it was forecast. But in the end, it ended up using a little bit more because of the conditions. But that's what they did. You can also, though, think about do I need to run all these batch jobs? Work backwards. What do I need? Can I split some of the computation? Where can I use caches? Don't run jobs when the underlying data doesn't change, and so on. So there are a lot of things you can do in that space as well. And then, last but not least, optimizing ML training. I mean, this is, I don't know how often this happens. I can say that we do have clients that do a lot of machine learning not at the scale of stable diffusion and, um, of course, Microsoft and OpenAI, but they do run machine learning models, and there's a lot of things you can do in machine learning um, to optimize it. I did, honestly, this is taken straight from a Google presentation, but, I mean, they have good ideas, right? Why not show them? And you can see there's a number of different things you can do. First thing, don't compute models that exist already. There's something like TensorFlow Hub, there's other ways also of getting models. There's the idea of transfer learning. You can take a trained model. Many people do this, of course, with the large language models, and then add your version to it. You can also, you can also make sure that what you're running is not running on CPUs. I mean, your data scientists will probably know quite quickly when it takes such a long time. But just in case, make sure you're running on GPUs or TPUs, these tensor processing units. Um, but there's also something, I don't know how much you know about machine learning, there's these fabled hyperparameters, which is a black art of tuning them. Have a strategy of tuning them, rather than just Monte Carlo and let's try 50 of them and let's see what works. There is software for this. Um, yeah, of course, Google would say use a managed service. But on the other hand, I mean, they know their hardware better than you do, so maybe there is some truth in that as well. And second last point, I mentioned several times now, train the model when you know the carbon emissions will be low. Last thing I want to mention, though, is this. I don't know how many of you know AWS or work with AWS. They have this thing called the Well-Architected Framework, and they have now added a whole section on sustainability. I'm not even sure whether you can read it, but I mean, this gives you an idea of what the topics are. The list itself is actually quite long. This is the full list, and I really like this. I mean, it's a really good checklist. I mean, it's not that you're like, these are earth-shattering insights I never thought about, but if you're just going through it and can think, we can do this, we can do that, that's difficult. Or what I would suggest is to even do, I mean, I'm a consultant, maybe do a quadrant and um, think about how difficult is it to implement and how much um, CPU, oh, sorry, CPU time, yeah, CPU time, how much energy can I save? And then go for the proverbial low-hanging fruit, right? If it can save a lot of um, carbon emissions and it's not hard to do, do that. Don't go for the ones that are hard to do and only give you small savings. You can also add, if depending on how your business operates, you can add another dimension on a different diagram saying, does it save me money or does it cost me money? And then maybe you actually can, the ones that save money, you probably even get funding for in your organization because you can show that you're saving money by reducing emissions. And that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There are quite a few questions that I can ask you. And I'll start with the first one. Is there anything we can do as cloud consumers and tech companies to push cloud providers to become carbon neutral faster? 
carbon neutral? Yeah, as I said, I mean, if you talk about carbon neutral, you're basically just making them buy certificates. So what you could do is you could ask them for the table, the report that Google wrote that I showed you, and maybe ask them, can we get such reports as a dashboard rather than as a report that is only published every couple of years? Or you could just vote with your feet or, and your wallet, if you have it, and say, look, I'm putting all my workload to Finland, for example, or Sweden, or where the carbon mix is better. Or you say, I'm not going to go to Finland and France because I don't like nuclear energy. You're making a political statement then. You could do that, and that would, of course, the cloud providers would notice and say, ooh, we obviously have a lot of demand for compute capacity in those regions, and we don't have as much demand in regions where the, the electricity mix is worse. That's how you can impact them in the end. Mm -hmm. Then another one, uh, I think based on a very uh, well-known article. What's your view on companies moving away from public cloud to server rentals to manage their own cloud infrastructure? We are obviously talking about Basecamp. Yeah, there's a couple of companies. They can do it, of course. I mean, it's commercial, right? I mean, in the end, if you believe you can run this more cheaply, and depending on how your organization is structured and what your goals are as an organization, that can make sense. As I said before, it is actually not that easy to get the efficiencies. I mean, maybe you can get it more cheaply, I don't know. And then you have to think, what is more important for me? But many organizations in this system are driven towards being the most profitable they could possibly be, and the cost to the environment is externalized. So that is maybe something where you need laws or regulations for that. Mm -hmm. Why companies are doing it, I think, is mostly just in the hope to save money. If you're really big, I mean, if you're Dropbox, it may make sense. If you are a regular e-commerce website, and even a big e-commerce website, I mean, I mentioned Otto, we also work for another large e-commerce um, company here in Germany. They are going to public clouds because it's cheaper than operating their own data centers. So I think there's a lot of myth around at what level, at what level of scale it actually saves you money. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last question, at least the last that I have here at the moment is, is there any way to enforce companies to publish their energy metrics like they nowadays do for availability metrics? So, what does force mean, right? I mean, there's what I said before. You can say, unless you publish this, I'm going to your competition. But you will find that the competition is also not publishing it, so that kind of limits what you can do. We saw, I mean, a company like Etsy is relatively principled. And as I mentioned, they could measure the actual electricity use, and they still went to the cloud because, on balance, it still made sense to them. They could have said, we're not going to GCP un until the day you publish this data, but they decided against it. It depends on the, on the relative power you have in, in such an example. And if you look at the market at the moment, at least if you look at Europe, there's three major cloud providers that we generally deal with. I mean, a lot of German companies have to deal, or not have to, but also have business in China when you start um, talking about different cloud providers, but there's only so much you can do. The other way, of course, is, as I mentioned, legislation. I mean, that is something where we can say, but how do you do it? How do you force it? You vote as an individual, not necessarily as a company, right? Okay, thank you. That's all the questions. Thanks a lot for this very interesting talk. Thank you again.